I'm Dr. J.D. Armstrong. I'm the Maui Technology Education and Outreach Specialist here at the uh, University of Hawaii Institute for Astronomy. And welcome to all of you. Uh, it's great to have you come to our talks. Um, and also, we have a satellite uh, broadcast at uh, Coronado Shores. So I wanted to say hello to those people out there, Les Fan and all, all the people there with you. Um, so yeah, we're broadcasting live. We've got somebody in the back checking out what's going on. Um, so, uh, Claire, so our speaker today is Claire Rafferty. Did I pronounce that quite? Or almost. Raf almost. Raftery. Raftery. Okay. okay. Raftery. 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 Okay. That one. That one's a gimme. That's a, that was close, and it was uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, but she's originally from Ireland, and she's the. Uh, almost stereotypical bagpipe uh, playing, uh, <laughs> Irish dancing, yeah, and uh, bagpipes are from Ireland originally. That's where they started yeah. from, the Irish yes. war pipes. Yeah. No, the Irish war pipes, the Ellen pipes are a whole different beast. Yes. We'll talk about that afterwards. <laughs> yeah. All right, so, um, and of course she has the wonderful Irish accent that is so infectious you're going to Fall in love with that. All questions are expected to be with the brogue. Just <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. And she received her uh, PhD in solar physics from Trinity College in Dublin. And after that, she uh, uh, went to Space Sciences Lab at UC Berkeley. And she was a mission scientist for RESI, the X-ray satellite, where she was studying high-energy flares in the sun. Um, she began volunteering for education and outreach because, well, she's just a wonderful person and, and she enjoyed it, I'm sure. And then she started doing more and more of that and moving away from science and finally transitioned full-fledged to uh, outreach in, what was it, 2013. Mm -hmm. And she was recently hired about a year ago, about a little over a year ago, a year. Uh, by the National Solar Observatory as their head of education and outreach. And so while she's out here, I decided we definitely wanted to hear what she had to say about uh, whatever she wanted to talk about. <laughs> and I think that it's going to be a great talk, uh, the solar spectacles. And so let's give her a nice warm Maui welcome. Thank you all very much. Unfortunately, my talk will not be about bagpipes today. I am going to bore you with astronomy, but hopefully it won't be too boring. Um, so thank you for that great introduction, D uh, JD. Um, I have lots of information to get through, but if there are questions that pop up along the way or things that are not quite clear, feel free to, to ask questions. Um, I'm normally based in Colorado, in Boulder, Colorado, at NSO's headquarters, but we have just hired a new education and public outreach officer to be based here in Maui full time. So Tashana is sitting here in the second row. Um, so if... <laughs> If you have questions as uh, you know, uh, later on or need anything from NSO, Tashana will probably be your point of contact. We also have some experts in the audience pointing emphatically at Dave here in the front. So all those technical questions that I won't be able to answer, I'm going to call on Dave for those. Um, so thank you for coming out today. Um, I hope that you enjoy this. I'm, I'm not sure how many solar science presentations you get at these seminars, but um, hopefully some daytime astronomy will help you keep, uh, stay awake as opposed to those dark nighttime skies. So uh, this, this slide I want to start with, this is a, a video that was taken by one of National, Sci uh, National Solar Observatory's um, solar telescopes in New Mexico, the, the Dunn Solar Telescope. So this is like a precursor to what will come with the, the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope that we're building here in Maui. So this is a little taster of what, of what is to come. Um, will this work? So we're very used to thinking about the sun as source of light and of energy, how we uh, can survive, the fact that we don't freeze to death, but equally the fact that we don't, uh, we're not uh, overexposed to too much sunshine. But today, um, I'm going to change gears a little bit and, oh, too fast, back one, there, no, darn technology. There we go. 
I want to talk about the sun in astronomical terms. So the sun is a star. Um, this is footage of the sun. Uh, this is moving much faster than real time. It takes about 14 days for the for sunspots to move from one side of the sun to the other. So you can imagine that this is significantly sped up. Um, and this is really what we think about the sun in the sky in uh, what we might see with our eyes. Of course, you have to be very careful if you're looking at the sun in the sky. You've got to make sure you have uh, your eyes protected and generally sunglasses are not good enough. Um, special glasses like eclipse glasses are usually a good way to go or solar filters if you're using a telescope. But uh, solar astronomers think this is very boring. We like to look b much beyond this and get into the, the nitty gritty of what the sun looks like. And that's things like this. So this is also footage of the sun. Um, these, these data are taken in ultraviolet, extreme ultraviolet images. And you can see that there's, there's a huge amount of stuff happening. There's bursts and there's explosions and there's light and there's dark and there's movement. And if we go to this one, we can see again, this is a different event, but it's still lots of stuff going on. And if we zoom in, we can see even more detail. You have this eruption, but then you also get all these bright stripes and you get some bits that are dark and some bits that are bright and so much happening. And this happens on the order of minutes. So this is not nearly as sped up as the previous, uh, the previous video. And we're going to take a little journey into what makes these things occur and how we can move forward. So the sun, um, when you think about the sun, what, is there, are there any words that jump to mind? What, what kind of things do you think of? Hot? Star? Yeah. Anybody else? It's big. I heard one over here. Average, yeah, it's fairly average as far as stars go. Uh, it is a. <laughs> I'm gonna let the astronomers answer that question. <laughs> so some of the words that I came up with when I was thinking about the sun: hot, explosive, dynamic, beautiful, important, powerful, interesting, confounding worthy of respect. But a phrase that we rarely think about when we think about the sun is still a mystery. And the sun very much is still a mystery uh, from a scientific perspective. We have started to understand it more in the last hundred or so years, but there are so many things that we have absolutely no explanation for. We have some great theories, but we don't have definitive explanations for. And as with everything in science, every time we answer one question, a hundred more pop up. So we're making life harder for ourselves as we go on, but at least we'll still have jobs. So I want you to take a moment to watch this video and to pay attention specifically to where the dark areas are and what happens when we look beyond the visible spectrum. So that first one was the visible light. This one is ultraviolet light. Let me back to visible for reference. And then we go to a different type of ultraviolet light, much cooler this time. The temperature is down here. And then finally, we're going to go to x-rays. And at x-rays, we're looking at 2 million degrees. So you're looking at ultraviolet light, cool ultraviolet, hotter ultraviolet, and x-rays. And you can see that the sun looks entirely different in all three of those wavelengths. And then you add in the visible light on top of that, and it's a whole different star. And when we compare these images, when we, when we actually look at specific regions, so all of these pictures are taken at the same time. So these are the same sun that we're just looking at with different filters. And you can see that on this top picture here, I do this, yeah. So on this top picture here, uh, we have these regions that are dark that correspond to regions that are bright on all of these other other pictures. And so hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll have maybe a little bit more idea of why that is the case. First of all, we're going to take it back to middle school and we're going to talk about bar magnets. Um, so magnetism is one of the most important factors in all of space and especially on the sun. It basically dictates everything that happens on the sun and it's very frequently overlooked. So if we have any potential undergraduates listening, pay attention to your electricity and magnetism classes because they're, they're the core of everything. Um, and this is true in solar physics as well. So this is a standard picture that I, I stole out of a textbook. It's a picture of a bar magnet, uh, north on the top, south on the bottom. And on top of this has been sprinkled some iron filings. And the iron filings trace out the shape of the magnetic field. It has this sort of butterfly shape. And that's fairly standard. There's nothing too surprising here. And when we compare this to what we see with the sun, it's actually not too different. This is fairly comparable to what we see when we look at solar images. Now, obviously, I've done a pr pretty poor uh, Photoshop job here of just copying the sun onto the center of this, uh, this 
magnetic field image. But if we look at actual data, this is a photograph that was taken um, of the solar eclipse from, two th I think it was the 2006 solar eclipse. And you can see that very, very roughly it looks the same. We have this, this spiky stuff sticking out of the two poles, and then we have loops that are sort of coming around the edge. But you can also see that it doesn't match in every single way. So um, when we're dealing with space, with astronomy, with things that we can't put our hands to, we have to use ideas and theories that we, we understand and we can test and apply them to these other, these other areas that we want to study and continue to iterate until they match so closely that there is no difference. And this is what we're doing here. So we look at the sun, we see that it has this kind of structure. First iteration is it's probably got a magnetic field, a global magnetic field of some kind. But then we move on and we say, what about all of this stuff? What about this messy stuff here on the side? That's clearly not just simple bar magnets. So in order to explain this, this is a, a, a graphic, an animation that was produced um, by NASA a number of years ago. And it's, it's, it, it does a, a fairly good job at explaining how the sun's magnetic field uh, really plays a role in generating all of that messy stuff on the side. But it's kind of confusing and it moves really fast. So I want to step you through it first and then I'll play the movie. So to dial you back here, this is the picture of the sun that we had. And these blue lines are the magnetic field, but they're not on the surface. They're ever so slightly beneath the surface in a specific region called the tachocline. And the tachocline is uh, it's, it's something that is still very much misunderstood or la not understood very well by uh, the science community. And so um, this is something that is mostly theorized. But we, we are starting to understand more and more how the magnetic field is generated beneath the surface. So uh, like I said, we have the magnetic field, which is this blue line. And then underneath the surface, this is what we're looking at. So this orange stuff here is just, just underneath the surface of the sun. Now, the sun is a ball of gas. It is just plasma. There is no solid part to it. The Earth has a solid core. It has solid continents. It has pieces to it that will rotate as a single entity. But because the sun is just a ball of plasma, as it rotates, it, it does, it's not tied to itself. So what that means is that as the sun rotates, the equator moves faster than the poles do. So this is this kind of stratification that we see here on Jupiter. We get similar stratification on the sun. We just don't see it as clearly because you don't have this mixing of gases that you do on Jupiter. And so when this happens, the magnetic field is tied into the plasma that's beneath the surface. So the plasma is moving faster at the equator and the magnetic field is connected into the plasma. And so it starts to get wrapped up in itself. And as this happens, you, oh, whoop, too fast, go back. As this happens, you end up with these bands of magnetic fields. So they get wrapped up and wrapped up and wrapped up. And you end up with these bands of magnetic field above and below the, uh, the sun's equator right here. And as this continues to happen, eventually there's so much wrapping that the magnetic field has nowhere to go and it starts to become magnetically buoyant. And it starts to rise up, it bursts up through the surface of the sun and it starts to appear outside of the surface of the sun. And this is what we see as coronal loops, but we'll get to that in a few minutes. How did we discover that? How did we discover? Well, th this is what I was saying. This is all theory. It's all hypothesized and tested uh, rigorously enough and compared to images that we can see and to, to data that we can collect. And this is the, this is the, the, best uh, the best hypothesis that has been put together so far. So this is the, the video. I'm going to let it play once or twice just because it happens quite quickly. Yeah, it is like a ball of string. I liken it to an elastic band sometimes where you put enough twist on it and it starts to kink itself up. So what I want you to notice is that you get these two bands above and below the equator as this happens. And it just so happens that the sunspots that we start to see also form above and below the equator. Um, this whole process takes on the order of five years or so. And then it takes about five years for all of these loops that have appeared to start to unwind themselves through uh, solar eruptions. And that five or so years plus five or so years is a little more than 10 years or 11 years. Um, and this is our solar cycle. So this is what drives the solar cycle. This is why we get the 11 year sunspot cycle. Um, and this is, a, this is a really key uh, 
a fundamental piece of understanding uh, where solar storms come from in particular. So these, the area in which these magnetic fields burst from just below the surface up through the surface, they appear in these dark spots called sunspots. And you can think of this as being like the surface of the sun just being pushed out of the way. So they appear dark because they're cooler than the rest of the sun, but they're still really hot. These are still on the order of thousands of degrees. But relative to this stuff out here, they are uh, quite a bit cooler. So they look like they were bright. If we could take a picture of just inside a sunspot, then it would still look bright. It's just the relative brightness is quite a bit darker. And this is a, a video that was taken recently. Um, this is uh, hydrogen beta. And you can see that there is a huge amount of movement happening. So in this little region down here, you can see that there's flows. You can see that there's, there's everything is moving constantly. Nothing is ever stable on the sun. And as we zoom in, you can see even more detail. So you can see that there are, there are flows moving in and there's flows moving out and there's stuff happening in the middle. It's not a completely black hole. You can see that there's still lots of stuff happening all the time. Everything, it's like a big boiling pot of oatmeal. So this process of the magnetic fields coming from below and bursting through the surface, uh, this is a, a, a cartoon. This is not real data, but this is a representation of what we uh, understand to happen as the, these silver magnetic field lines burst out through the surface. Now, of course, magnetic field lines are invisible, so we can't see this happen. All we can do is use the, the result of what we can see with magnetic fields and hypothesize what we think is going on. So as the magnetic field lines start to come up through the surface, they push the surface plasma out of the way, and that starts to appear dark. And then what we can see, I'll just let this play to the end, and then uh, move on to the next stage. So what we can see, uh, oh, sorry, if I move this way, what we can see are these big arches of um, magnetic loops. So these, these magnetic field lines would otherwise be invisible if it weren't for the fact that we have highly ionized plasma. So an ion is um, an atom that has had some of its electrons, in this case, removed. It also is when they're, they've been added. But when we remove some of our electrons, we have an atom that now has a charge. And so charged atoms, um, or ions we call them, behave comparably to, uh, to, to um, the likes of iron filings when it comes to magnetic fields. They get stuck onto these magnetic field lines and they trace them out, similar to that bar magnet shape that we, we found. If we turn the bar magnet on its side and lay it so the north was on this side and the south was on this side, this big loop would be similar to what we saw with the iron filings. And these are, these are just some really spectacular images that the, uh, the Dunn Solar Telescope, the National Solar Observatory's um, uh, telescope in New Mexico took. So these, the next four images are all of exactly the same sunspot at the same time. And just to show you how very different everything looks uh, when you take pictures using different filters. So in solar astronomy, it's really important that we take pictures in all of astronomy, but in solar astronomy, because we can actually resolve the detail on the sun, taking pictures using different filters helps us to piece together the story and build the body of evidence that helps us really to understand what it is that we're seeing. So these are all the same picture, just at different wavelengths. So that first one was the, the surface of the sun. This is the photosphere, we call it. Next up, this is the, the lower chromosphere. So this is the, the next layer of the sun. And again, we're just getting slightly higher into the chromosphere. And you can see how very different this one is to this one. You have all the, so this is like looking, if you, if you had a, a loop like this and you chopped it off halfway along and you were looking down, you're just looking at the, the, the legs of it. This one here, we're looking at the tops. So it looks like these, you get these long, uh, long, thin structures that you start to see. And again, we go further into the chromosphere. Isn't that spectacular? I think they're absolutely gorgeous. And so piecing all of these together, along with the theoretical models and the magnetohydrodynamics and the plasma physics and all of the fluid dynamics going on, we're able to start to piece together the elements that make up this puzzle and come up with theories and explanations that help us to um, make sense of what it is that we're seeing. Because it's not simple. It's definitely a very complicated and complex system. And the fact that you have a magnetic field and ionized plasma. The two of them together basically make up some of the most complex physics that you can possibly wrap your head around. So inside of these sunspot areas, 
Um, this is where the origin of most solar flares and solar eruptions called coronal mass ejections happen. So this is a sequence of videos, again in different wavelengths, showing the same event as it occurs. And so as you look in different wavelengths, in some of them you see the solar flare and in others you don't. So if we go wait till it goes back to the visible, which is the yellow light, which should happen momentarily, you can see a very small flash w as the solar flare happens. There you go, barely a little ripple. But then when you go into a uh, different wavelength, so this is ultraviolet, all of a sudden you see this really bright, uh, this, this brightening happening. And this is the solar flare. So the solar flare is a release of energy and light. Uh, there's an awful lot of confusion between solar flares and coronal mass ejections. The flare is the energy release, and then the coronal mass ejection is the stuff. So this should show you the difference between them. So this is the sun in here in the middle, and we're flying from space. This is all real data, I should say. Um, we're moving from close to the Earth all the way down to the surface of the sun. This is the sun in ultraviolet. And then this red stuff here and the blue that you'll see in just a moment, this is the solar flare. These are observations taken with RESI, the high energy um, spacecraft that I used to work for. And then this is a coronagraph that allows us to see all of the faint stuff that happens out in the outer parts of the, uh, the heliosphere. So the heliosphere is the sphere influenced by the sun and it, it reaches all the way out past the planets. And so the combination of the solar flare, which is what's happening right here, it's the energy release, the pulse of light, and that happens, that's multiple atomic bombs released in the order of seconds to minutes, versus the coronal mass ejection, which is a release of material and magnetic field that gets flung out from the sun, out through space. And this is what drives the aurora borealis, for example. This is what drives solar storms. This is another image of just the coronagraph. And you can see this is, on this side, we think this is a nice little CME, and then all of a sudden you get a crazy big eruption on this side of the sun. So in this case, we've blocked out the sun here in the middle. This is called a coronagraph, which is allows us to see the corona. The corona is this outer layer of the, of the sun. The, the, it's named after the, uh, the sun's crown. Um, and it's significantly fainter, many, many, many times fainter than the surface light of the sun. So that's why we have to block out the surface. So it's a bit like me standing in this, this bright light here. And if I wanted to see any of your faces, I would have to block this out to be able to see you because it's too bright for me to be able to, to pick out the faintness in, of the rest of the room. And so it's the same idea here where we block out, we shadow this surface of the sun so as we can see all of this faint stuff. And then this is a similar type of instrument. It's just, uh, it's got a slightly larger field of view. So in this case, the sun is where this little white light, uh, white, white disc should be. And you can see that this kind of, these kind of eruptions happen all the time. This is, this is on the order of a few days. This is not very, very long. And we get multiple ones of these. So this is not unusual for us, but we do want to be able to understand them because these are the source of space weather. So space weather is becoming a more and more, um, a, a topic of more and more interest and more and more relevance to us, especially with technology and our dependence on the likes of uh, GPS systems. And the Department of the Defense is very interested in them. And farmers are very interested because farmers now use GPS for in planting their seeds so they know exactly where their crops are. Uh, ships are usually docked using uh, GPS. There's all kinds of, of um, influences with GPS. They can also affect our power grids. So these, uh, these eruptions are full of highly ionized plasma and magnetic field. And so they can induce big electric fields, uh, field currents in our power grids, which can um, result in the power grids going offline. And uh, there's been estimates that it could take up to 18 months for power grids to be replaced because they don't just keep these big transformers lying around. But that's a talk for another day. JD will have to pin me down the next time I'm back to talk about space weather. But ultimately, this all comes back to our bar magnet. The, the, the understanding of what's happening with our bar magnet is applicable at every level to our understanding of what's happening with the sun. So magnetic fields, are they're kind of a mystery to us. Um, they're invisible. We can't see them. This room is full of magnetic fields. If you had a, a little compass and you walked around the room, every time you encountered anything with a speaker or a magnet or it's, uh, an electrical socket, anything that has electricity running through it, all of these generate magnetic fields, which um, it, it, it 
it means that they they don't impact us on a like on a regular basis through our life but understanding how they are uh, how they move how they are uh, they break how they change on the sun is really key to our understanding of what's happening with the sun so the same as we can use the iron filings we can use hot plasma on the sun as a tracer for the magnetic field like i said earlier the ions get trapped on the loops and they help us to see where these magnetic field lines are um so luckily for us, uh, light is an electromagnetic wave. And so it's, it, it's affected by the presence of these magnetic fields. And measuring the changes in this light can really help us, understanding about the, uh, help us understand magnetic field strength and direction. So this, this image here is one that perplexes me too. So don't worry if it, it um, is a little bit much. This is an image that shows the, one of the core principles of um, how we measure magnetic fields on the sun. So this is, this is intensity. So this is just uh, a picture of using a very special detector, unaffected. And then each of these are what we call Stokes parameters. And each of these are measuring the polarization of light in a very specific way. So this one of them is measuring horizontal polarization. Another one is measuring vertical polarization. And then the third one is measuring so, uh, circular polarization. So I'm not going to go into too much detail on this. You're going to have to pin Dave down up here if you want to know more about polarization. He is literally our polarization expert. He knows more about this than anybody I've ever met. But the principles are that the distance that you can separate, that you can see the separation, um, see the way we have the separation of these lines, the distance that these are separated can tell us about how strong the magnetic field is. And the ratio between these three will tell us about the magnetic field direction. So like I said, I'm not going to go into any more detail than that, but just to know that polarization, spectropolarimetry is the core of how we can understand um, magnetic field strength on the sun. And it's going to become important. So right now, all that we can do uh, with any kind of regularity or accuracy is we can measure the surface magnetic field. So this is a, a video showing the magnetic field of the sun where gray big regions of magnetic fields start to grow and they come out and they dissipate and they break apart and some of the the uh, sunspots come back again multiple times and these all, all of these regions are the the solar magnetic fields coming out from under the surface and up through the surface and these appear to us as sunspots but what we really want to be able to do, to do to understand what's going on with the sun in much more detail and to be able to work towards predicting solar storms is we want to be able to understand something more like this. So this gray layer on the inside, this is the same as what we have back here. But all of these, these sprouts, these, these uh, red and green and blue areas, this is where all the action is. This is how we can really get towards understanding what's happening on a much more detailed and, and uh, purposeful level. So to observe the magnetic field, we need uh, a, few, a few things to be able to observe them on the kind of detail, the scales that we really want to. First of all, we need high resolution. So we need to be able to get in at the smallest, smallest scales. So magnetic fields, they, they, you know, they, they create sunspots, but there's hundreds of thousands of magnetic field strands that are popping up through every one of these sunspots. So to be able to resolve them, we've got to be able to see them in close enough detail. So all of a sudden, our, our uh, are, are 1,000 by 1,000 or even 4,000 by 4,000 pixels, are they're not really going to cut it anymore. We also need lots of photons. So the more photons we can see, the brighter the image, the more resolution, the higher the contrast, the better the picture is. And we also need it over a broad range of wavelengths. So I've shown you a few different examples of how s observing the sun at different wavelengths is really important to piece together what's going on. So we need to maintain this, this wide range of different filters. And lucky for, all, for us, having a large aperture telescope is at the center of all of these. And in addition, we also need an excellent suite of instruments. So funny you should say that because we just happen to be building one of these on, uh, uh, on Maui right now. So the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope, um, it used to be called the Advanced Technology Solar Telescope, uh, is scheduled for first light in 2019. This National Science Foundation project is going to completely change the face of solar physics. This is going to revolutionize how we see the sun and our understanding of the sun. Every time a new uh, telescope, a new satellite or a new telescope comes online, it changes our understanding. It, it opens doors. It helps us to see things that we've never seen before. But the, the, uh, the change 
changes that are expected with a DKIST telescope, we can't even predict what they're going to look like. This is definitely not incremental science. This is revolutionary, both in an engineering sense and also in a scientific sense. So when it's built, the DKIST uh, will be a four meter telescope. Um, which, for those of you who are used to nighttime telescopes, you're like, Psh, that's, that's peanuts by comparison. Um, but a four meter solar telescope. So think about the fact that you have four meters worth of sunlight focused onto a single point. Think about you know, being able to use a magnifying glass as a kid and burning grass or you know, using that to focus the sun. Now, what if you had a four meter um, a magnifying glass and what you would be able to do. So when it's, when it's, uh, when it's working at full power, the DKIST will have 13 kilowatts worth of energy that will need to be removed. Um, think about the heat of that. So that's about 15 stadium lights focused on a single point. Right? So we're talking very significant energy. And by comparison, the current largest solar telescope that exists is 1.6 meters. So you can, you can start to get an idea of the, the leap that we're going to be taking from the Big Bear New Solar Telescope to DKIST. So this is, this is no mean uh, engineering feat. This is requiring some of the best minds in this field to be able to troubleshoot. Just the, the heating problem alone with this is pretty astronomical, pun intended. So this, <laughs> this, is, a, this is a schematic of, our, uh, of what the DKIST will look like. So it's, it's very, there's a lot of information, so try and bear with me here. So uh, on the outside, we have our dome right here. And on the dome, there is a circular aperture, four meter aperture that will be right here. And this is where the sunlight will come in. So this is what this yellow beam is. And right here, we'll have our four meter mirror. And this, this mirror will gather all of these photons and it will send it up to our uh, prime focus and our secondary mirror, and then down through the rest of the optical path. And so for, for context, these are these yellow barriers here. They're about hip height. So you can, you know, a, a person would probably be about this size. So this is a very, very large piece of uh, machinery. And I can vouch for this. I saw that the, this is now starting to come together at the summit. They've just installed the primary mirror um, uh, support structure. They're about to install the secondary mirror support structure. So it's starting to look like a telescope, which is very, very exciting. And then as we come down from the, the, we call this top area, the telescope mount assembly, and it comes down through the optical, uh, the optical system right here onto this rotating platform. So this is called the CUDE platform. Um, and you can see this is a, a person right here. And this is where all of our instruments will be located. So we won't have, a, a, at least not initially, we won't have any instruments up here at the top. They'll all be located down here on this platform. So this whole platform rotates slowly throughout the day because as the sun moves across the sky, it will appear to spin in our, in our, uh, in our field of view. So if you just put a camera on the back of the, the telescope part of the, uh, the DKIST, the sun would rotate throughout the day. So because of the kind of science that we're trying to do, we can't have that happen. That would, that would cause a lot of, uh, a lot of um, issues in our instruments, and it would also cause the sun to appear to be blurred. So we're trying to get the highest resolution that we possibly can. So blurring is definitely not an option for us. And so instead of rotating the, uh, trying to rotate the sun um, artificially using uh, technology, instead what we do is we rotate everything with it. So as the sun rotates, all of the instruments rotate as well. So all of this rotation is canceled out and it all appears to be stable. But of course you have this giant rotating platform which needs to be cooled and powered and have electricity and have internet. And of course this presents itself with a whole new set of challenges. So just getting the cable wrapping issue sorted out was a, a feat of its own. And then down here as we go down, these are the, uh, the inner piers, the, 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 these are the, the stability points for the, the telescope, and of course then the outer uh, shell of the enclosure. So this is the DKIST. Um, it, is, it is going to really, like I said, it's going to change how we do solar physics uh, for the better. So a little bit about our instruments. Um, the visible broadband imager, this is uh, the... This is the quote-unquote simple, um, far from simple uh, 
uh, instrument on board. Uh, this is going to, it's been built by the National Solar Observatory in Boulder, Colorado right now. And this is going to take multi-wavelength uh, images of the sun in a 60 by 60 arc second. So arc seconds, this is, a, this is probably a little bit bigger than the actual field of view. So you can see that we're still dealing with a very small field of view, but that's the compromise that you have to make when you want to get to the, the scale lengths that we need to get to. And so we'll be able to create these multi-wavelength stacks of images uh, in quite short periods of time. To if we, if, if we thought these uh, pictures of the sunspots that I showed you earlier were spectacular, you're going to be in for quite the treat. So then we go to the visible spectropolarimeter, which is being built by the High Altitude Observatory, which is one of the National Science Foundation's other solar physics institutions. They're also based in Boulder. Boulder, it turns out, is sort of a hub of solar physics. Um, and VISP, we call it, V-I-S-P, is a series of slits. So anybody here who has ever worked in spectroscopy, this is a slit spectrometer. So along this slit, this behaves a bit like a prism. So as the light passes through the split, it splits the light into its different components. And that means that that allows us to measure the spectrum. And so as you move the slit uh, from one, one side to another, you're able to gather the spectrum of each of these geographical locations on the sun to build up a square. Uh, to build up a, a field of view with not only um, not only uh, intensity information, so not just looking at the picture, but also looking at the spectrum, looking at the wavelength information. And of course, wavelength and spectroscopy and the spectrum of the sun, that's the fingerprint of what's happening. So this is what tells us how hot it is, what gases are there, what the magnetic field is doing. It basically helps us to characterize everything that's going on. So if you can get a good spectrum, you, this is where we do all of the real science. Not all of the real science, it's where we do a lot of the real science. <laughs> I'll annoy some, uh, some imagery people if I say that. So this is a, an animation of VISP. So I showed you earlier on that, that polarimetry plot that has the, the Stokes vectors on it. And this is the same idea. So this is the intensity profile here. And as you can see, we're starting to build up the picture of the sunspot as, as it like, scans across. So you can think of this as like taking slices through the sunspot um, in, in this direction. And then we, once we uh, pass this information through a series of optics um, that uh, uh, that allow us to get at the different polarization states, you can see that all of these polarization states look really quite different. And this allows us to build up this picture of the magnetic field and understanding what the magnetic field is doing at all different size scales. Then we moved on to the, the visible tunable filter. So this VTF, we call it, has been built by the Kippenhauser Institute in, uh, in Germany. And this is one of our significant partners for this project. And the VTF um, basically allows us to take uh, pictures of the sun at different wavelengths, uh, uh, over a whole range of different wavelengths in quick succession. So I have a little animation that shows this better than my, my still frame can do. So down here, this is, this is a, an emission line. So this allows us to take images at different wavelengths in very quick succession. And you can see that as we do this, all of the Stokes parameters and the intensity image looks really very different. So this, again, building up this picture of understanding of what's going on with the magnetic field. Next up, we have uh, one of the IFA's uh, two instruments on board. This is the Diffraction Limited Near Infrared Spectropolarimeter. Rolls off the tongue. We call it DL NERSP for short, and it's actually just down the hallway here. It's been built. Um, and this, this imager, um, this, this instrument is not only is it going to take pictures of the disk, but it's also going to allow us to take pictures of this corona outside of the sun. So it, it has some very uh, special characteristics that allows us to be uh, both sensitive to the photosphere and to the corona. And uh, sorry, not to the photosphere, the, all of the, the disk layers as well as the corona. Um, and this is really, this is not only is it important, it's very difficult to do because like I said earlier, the brightness difference between the sun's disk and the sun's corona is huge. So you have to have an instrument that is able to adapt very, very quickly. So the way DL NERSP does this, it has a bundle of fiber optic cables. So this is very much blown up. The field of view of the sun here would be, it would be much, much smaller, but this is just for representation. So we have a bundle of optical fibers that um, take, they, they're focused on the sun and they, they gather the information coming from the sun. And they're passed through a series of complex optics that Dave can tell you all about. Um, and on the other end, they start to build up this 
two-dimensional image of the sun, but at continuous wavelengths. So each of these gives us different spectral information of the sun. So you can see that a lot of these instruments are building up this three-dimensional package. We've got space in the X and Y, so we've got, we've got an image, a two-dimensional image in this direction, but we've got sp uh, spectral information in the, other, in the other direction. But we, in each of these images, we, or in each of these instruments, we compromise in a different way. So one of them we compromise spatially with the, the scanning slit spectrometer. In another one we compromise um, uh, with the spectral information where we take a single spectral um, slice at different uh, different points. This one here allows us to try and compromise as little as possible because we take spectral information with each one of these optical fibers simultaneously across this two-dimensional field. So this is really quite revolutionary. And then this little video allows you to get an idea of how we piece together all of this. So this optical bundle moves across an area of the sun to build up the, this picture. And again, we have the... Um, the intensity and then the magnetic field Stokes profiles over here. And then finally, we have the cryogenic near-infrared spectropolarimeter, or cryonersp. So in many ways, this instrument is quite similar to the, uh, to the, the, ori the, the first, uh, the uh, vis uh, VISP <laughs> instrument. Sorry, it took me a while to make sure I got my, in my V instruments correct. Uh, the VISP instrument, which also uses these um, Stokes pro uh, profiles. But the difference here is that we're using infrared um, lines to be able to do this. So uh, different emission lines um, that are emitted by the sun are more or less sensitive to the magnetic field. So when we're looking on the disk, the magnetic field is really strong. It's thousands of Gauss strong. When we're looking out here in the corona, it's really weak. It's only single counts of Gauss. So it's five or six Gauss out here in the corona versus maybe thousands of Gauss here. So because it's so weak, we have to have a very, very bright line, an emission line to be able to do this kind of work. And uh, the best lines that we can use happen to be in the infrared. And that's very fortunate because normally when we look at the sun, um, if I scroll back a few slides, this is a bad idea. Let me do it this way instead. If I scroll back to this slide, this is a real photograph of the sun at uh, this, the summit of Haleakala. And you can see that there's this structure that, granted it doesn't look like the real corona, but the point is that you can see that, this, uh, that the sun up here has these, these lines coming off of it. Um, and so if we are taking pictures uh, during the day with the sun, you can see that this, this happens. However, when we go back to here, if we are taking pictures using infrared light, uh, that blue background that you see that the, the structure of the sun is, is projected on, that blue is now dark. So the sun is basically at nighttime when you're looking at it in infrared from, from the Earth. And that's because the, all of that scattering that happens only happens in visible light. It doesn't happen in infrared. And so it means not only do we have very sensitive um, emission lines that allows us to get a really, really good view of how these work, but there's no background messing it up. It's, it's basically been projected onto darkness. So this is uh, the, the instruments, like I said earlier, they'll, the, the light from the telescope will come in, it'll hit our primary mirror, up to our prime focus and secondary mirror, down through the optical system and onto this coude rotator. And all of our instruments will lie together on this, this coude rotator. And they'll, the, uh, the light will be funneled through uh, a series of, optical, uh, a f series of optics that will distribute it. And the nice thing about this, and the really, uh, the, the really important thing about this, is that we can use up to four out of the five instruments simultaneously. The, the cryonursp instrument has to be used on its own, but all of the rest of the four can be used at the same time. So that's a really big deal as far as being able to piece together all of this information and the evidence to build up our, our picture of what's going on. So um, I think I'm pretty much done with my, my, th my slides just now. The, the, the next slide um, is a little montage of the, uh, the coude rotator and the telescope mount assembly as it's being assembled at Ingerall, which is the company that built the... Uh, built the, these structures for us. Now, they've since been dismantled, moved to Maui, and are now re reconstructed up at the summit. So these, these are now in the uh, telescope enclosure. So we're really moving forward towards being finished.
rotation designed to counteract the Earth's rotation? Is that right? It's designed to counteract the sun's rotation, which occurs as a result of the, the Earth's rotation. So this structure, this piece right here, this will be where the primary mirror goes, this table thing right here. So all of this is now on the mountain and is ready and waiting for a primary mirror to be delivered. So this usually has very atmospheric music over it, but we couldn't get the music to play. So are there any videos online? They are online. So if you go to the DKIST website, so if you go to nso.edu and then go to DKIST, you can get them there. JD? Oh, I'm sorry. So the question was, are any of these videos online? Uh, and yes, they are. If you go to www.nso.edu and then you visit the DKIST page, which is dkist.nso.edu, um, these videos are in our video archive. Or you can go to any of our social media pages. So I'll leave this final slide up um, as I take questions. But uh, as many of you know, or um, if not, Hey, guess what? Uh, there'll be an eclipse later this year. So the, we have a, an eclipse website dedicated to explaining how the eclipse will affect the sun scientifically. We also have um, monthly webcasts that we produce that cover more of this kind of science in much shorter snippets and in a much broader range. So these are available. You can get them through our eclipse website or you can go straight to our YouTube page. Um, and I encourage you to follow us on social media. This is where we basically post all of our updates and announcements of things that will be be going on and if you need to reach us outreach at nso.edu would be more than happy to answer your questions and I'm more than happy to answer your questions now live as well if anybody has any <laughs> I guess not everybody can go home <laughs> all right yes mm-hmm The sun, uh, so the question is, what does the sun have inside? That the earth has a liquid core and a mantle and so on. But what does the sun have inside? That's a really good question. So th the sun is gas and nothing all the way through. So the most inner layer of the sun, we call it the core. And it's a region where... Um, where fusion is driving all of the energy production in the sun. So it's, it's just raw atoms. It's mostly hydrogen and helium and a few uh, heavier elements. Above this, we have the... Um, Above this, we have the, the radiation zone, which you can think of as being mostly empty space. So because it's, it's mostly empty, light from the core and energy from the core can just travel in close to straight lines and get, get all the way. Um, get all, sorry, no, that's, that's not true at all. So <laughs> even though it is mostly empty space, as the light starts to propagate from there, it interacts with the atoms that are inside of the radiation zone. And it takes millions of years for the light to get from the core out to the, the convection zone, which is the next layer. But the radiation zone... Um, I, I, this, this region I find really interesting because the, uh, the, the radiation pressure coming from the inside of the core that's pushing out on the sun is balanced perfectly by the gravitational pressure coming from the outside of the sun. So you basically have this core of the star and then this outer shell and then very, very little by way of uh, in between. Um, and so this, uh, above the radiation zone, we have the convection zone, which is much, much thicker, much denser. And this is where the sun starts to um, transfer its energy in a similar way to boiling oatmeal. So the energy is uh, transferred from the bottom layers and it starts to move outwards away from the core. Um, and then it starts to cool down as, it's, as it dissipates its energy and then it drops back down again. So you get these huge big convection cells. But the craziest thing about it is that once you get to the surface, we're at you know, five to 6,000 degrees. And as we go out into the atmosphere, the sun gets to a million degrees and we have no idea why. Magnetic fields are our best explanation, but we really don't know. The person who understands this theory of why the sun's, uh, that we call it the solar coronal heating problem, I am convinced I'll get the Nobel Prize because this is, this is something we just cannot fathom. There are two main theories, but really we don't have any good explanation. So we're hoping that uh, DKIST will help to maybe push some of this forward. Any more questions? Oh. Our sun has a coronal heating. Mm -hmm. Other stars have a coronal heating. 
That's a good question. I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, I'm sure somebody at the IFA would be able to answer much better than I can, and JD is nodding yes. So I didn't repeat the question. The, the question was that do other stars also have this coronal heating problem? So question back here somewhere, yeah? Mm-hmm. So that we can monitor the infrared coming off of the system. How do you measure that with the sun? I mean, you don't really have any black dot areas, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so let me let me see if I understand your question. So the, the question was that um, when you're measuring infrared light here, it has to be a dark room. And so how do you monitor or how do you how do you mitigate that with the sun? Um, so uh, when you're on the Earth, everything everything that is living and a lot of things that are not living is are putting off infrared. So it's very closely related to heat. That is not something that we have to worry so much about on the sun. Uh, obviously, the sun is still producing a lot of infrared light, but the same as it's producing a lot of visible light or a lot of ultraviolet light. It's not the, uh, the, the sources that we're looking at, we can still start to picture um, fairly well. I actually don't know if I have a good answer for this. Do you have a good answer for this, Dave? So the sun is a direct source of illumination, so you, you wouldn't have other light sources competing in the system. You can just get directly the light coming from the sun. So let me let me repeat let me repeat that for the camera. So the the sun is the the single source of all of the light when it comes to infrared um, in solar astronomy. When you're looking at infrared on the Earth, you have interference from other light sources. So your 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 human subject is the source of the infrared you want to be able to see. But um, light uh, lights will produce infrared. Other humans in the room, electronics, they'll all produce other infrared radiation that will interfere with your you, the, the subject that you're trying to image. When we're looking at the sun in space, there isn't any of that extra interference, so we don't have to worry about everything else. So we basically have a dark room because there is nothing else out there. Thank you. Yes? So Uh, that's a great question. So the, the sor what is the source of solar magnetism is the question. So the sun, I, I mentioned earlier, is uh, it's a plasma. So a plasma is um, a, a ball or a, 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 an amount of ionized gas. So all of the gases that we see um, are... Uh, most of the gases on the sun are ionized. So they have electrons that have been stripped off them because there's just so much energy and so much heat in the sun that these electrons can be stripped off fairly easily. But these electrons are now floating around the sun. These, these exist on their own. And I mentioned earlier in that the, the animation that I showed you that the sun rotates um, faster at the poles than it does at the equator. So those electrons are moving around the poles and they're moving a, a, a series of moving electrons are, is a circuit. And so when you have a circuit, you get an electric field. And when you get an electric field, you induce a magnetic field. A moving electric field, you induce a magnetic field. So the magnetic field is as a result of these, uh, these free electrons that are produced um, by the excess energy in the sun, the excess heat. Does that help? OK. Any more questions? Uh, I, I don't know much about Jupiter and its magnetic field, but I, I, I can say that this, the stratification that we see on Jupiter um, is very similar to what we see on the Sun. That's, this is a, a term that we call differential rotation, and this is like I just talked about, the, the movement of the equator uh, material moving faster than the poles. So I don't know about Jupiter's magnetic field, though. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't speak to that. Any more? Yes? No, there's, there's a lot of iron in the sun, and especially in the corona. Actually, iron is one of the best markers that we can use. Because it, has, uh, because it has so many electrons, it frequently has a lot of its electrons stripped off. And so that means that there's the, it has a huge number of ionization states, so we can measure it. So in the core, um, there's, the, there's the hydrogen burning cycle um, that, that is driving uh, the production of all of these different heavier elements. And as far as I remember, I haven't thought about this since graduate school, but I think the, the burning chain stops with iron. So I think that's the end of the burning chain.
Yes. Yeah, this is kind of an engineering question, which I've asked before and never gotten a straight answer. You have a mirror that's four meters wide collecting a lot of heat mm -hmm. and other sources of energy. Mm -hmm. Are you planning to do anything with that energy? Are you dumping it into the atmosphere? And if not, are you getting the energy to operate the scope straight from neutral? Uh, so as far as I know, uh, the energy is going to be removed at the heat stop, which is right at the prime focus. So the, the light comes into the primary mirror and gets to the prime focus. Um, and it, it's removed by liquid cooling. So there's liquid dynaline that is removing the majority of the heat uh, through, the, the, through the optical systems there. Um, it, to my knowledge, there is n no plan to try and harness that energy. I don't know if we even could harness the energy if, if, we, if we could, uh, if we wanted to. Um, but that's a, certainly a good idea. I'm sure it's one that has been thought of by the engineering team, but I, 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 don't, I don't think that is on the cards. Uh, I don't know how much is required to operate the scope. I know there's 13 kilowatts um, that of energy that's dumped into the I into the scope, but I, I don't know how much energy is required to actually make it run. It's a good question, though. I'll try and find out for you. Any more questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I all I know is that it's called a Dyson sphere, um, and that it's pretty popular in science fiction. I don't know much about the the practical side or the uh, the whether or not that's something that we can. Um, consider down the line. The the question was, did I did I know anything about how uh, about Dyson spheres and maybe whether that is something we could consider in the future? But I I don't have an answer for you. I'm afraid I I don't know anything about that. Be great if we could though. <laughs> Any more questions? No. Okay. Well, in that case, thank you all for having me. I hope you enjoyed the talk, and I'll be around for questions. <laughs>